Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This evening again in collaboration with my brother in Christ from the United States of America, Tom Fress, from Inquisition Update, because we are gathered here together to continue our study that the New Testament is the absolute and uh, perfect confirmation that Jesus Christ, our Messiah, fulfilled Daniel's 70th week as prophesied to the prophet Daniel in Babylonian captivity about 605 to 600 years before Jesus Christ came, that he would be the Messiah to come, that there were 70 weeks determined upon thy people and thy holy city to make an end of discretion, and that end would be Jesus Christ's ministry. We are going to read in the New Testament confirmation of exactly that fact, that Jesus Christ was the complete and perfect fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. We have started our study uh, with a few different verses from Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, 25, 26, and now we are in Hebrews for the moment. We are reading the complete chapter 10 of Hebrews. We left off last time where we have to continue today. That means the next one I think we are reading is verse 10 or verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 10. And therefore I want to warmly welcome my brother Tom Fress on the other side of the big lake to the broadcast today and to do the study together with me for you that you understand that Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel and there is no future fulfillment. Have Absolutely. Time. That's a wonderful statement, Jörg. There is no future 70th week of Daniel. If Jesus, as we have proven and will continue to prove in the New Testament from showing you as many proof texts as we can find that Jesus was the perfect and complete fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. It's over. That seven-year period of time, which you hear so much about in all the churches, was over 2,000 years ago. There's, And if it's over, if that 70th week of Daniel is over and completely fulfilled, then there is no future fulfillment. And there is no future 70th week of Daniel. There is no future seven-year period of time. And everything that's attached to that seven-year period is a lie. It's being taught in the churches is a lie. 
There's no seven years of great tribulation. Now, neither York nor I are telling anybody that there won't be tribulation for the saints. The, Christ, the, the, the Bible plainly says those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So, uh, and we're not saying that there won't be great tribulation for God's people. Okay? But uh, certainly, uh, when the persecution and tribulation comes, it will not be for just seven years. It's going to be until Christ returns. And uh, uh, so, so we're going to have to get into the mindset uh, when we're speaking to fellow Christians, and that means just about everyone who uh, calls himself a Christian uh, is of the belief that the 70th week of Daniel is yet to be fulfilled in the future. And so we must be constantly correcting and showing these proof texts in the New Testament, proving that the 70th week of Daniel is over, and also showing the error of saying that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future because it asserts that Messiah has not come in the flesh. Because Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come, will come at the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. And uh, that was perfectly fulfilled 2,000 years ago. So I know much of this is, is repeat for many of you, but it doesn't, it bears repeating from time to time. We don't lose uh, our sight of our objective. And uh, that is to stop this teaching that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future. And of course... Everything that's attached to it is a lie and given God's people a false hope. Okay, Our hope is in Jesus. Our hope is in the historical 70th week of Daniel, which was Jesus Christ's ministry in the flesh in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. So uh, we, uh, we're not about uh, fables, craftily devised fables fables to deceive God's people. We're about exposing those craftily devised fables and uh, showing you scriptural proof text to the assertions that we make. And just one more thing before I hand it back to Yerk. We have to remember this, that what we preach is called historicism. Okay? That's the historical school of Bible prophecy interpretation, which says the 70th week of Daniel was already fulfilled in history 2,000 years ago. That's the historical fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. And that's the only fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. That means Jesus came right on time at the beginning of that 70th week, made a covenant with many for one week for a seven-year period of time, in the midst of that week, he caused the sacrifice and oblation to cease by giving up his own life, putting a permanent end to sacrifices and oblations. The sacrifice to end all sacrifices was what Jesus came to do. That was the very purpose for Christ's first coming. And to say that that is to be done yet future is to simply say, Jesus was not the Christ. And that's the victory that futurism has over God's people. To get them to say with their mouths, while they're professing Jesus with their mouth, as we are instructed to do in the scriptures, we are out of the other side of our mouth denying that he ever came. That's literally what you do when you say, the 70th week of Daniel is yet future. Messiah has not yet come in the flesh. And that, according to the scripture, is the very spirit of Antichrist. Exactly my and point. Who, and who have we said all along is the Antichrist? The same one that has been claimed to be the Antichrist by Bible-believing, God-fearing people for the last 2,000 years all the way back to the first century Christians under Paul's ministry. 
Paul told them precisely who the Antichrist would be. First, there would come a great falling away, a falling away from the faith, an apostasy, a great apostasy from the faith. Paul was even saying that much of this apostasy would take place even before his, his demise. And they were seeing people leaving the church and joining occultic groups and, and spreading false gospels. And Paul was out trying to correct the record. And he even wrote a letter to the Thessalonians after he had been with them in person speaking about who this man of sin would be that would come as a result of this great falling away. He told them precisely who it would be. And he also told them precisely who was restraining his rise to power. That's the, the restrainer. Okay? And he reiterates in writing in his letter to the Thessalonians who that restrainer was. And he couldn't mention it in the writing for fear that the writing, the letter, would fall into Roman hands. But he was simply confirming as best he could in that letter to the Thessalonians what he had told them to their faces when he was there with them. Don't you remember when I was with you, I told you these things, he said? What things? Who would be the man of sin, the son of perdition, that would rise as soon as the restrainer, that is, the civil government of Rome, was taken out of the way? The very civil Roman government that eventually killed Paul and who crucified Christ. That very government was what was restraining the rise of the papacy. And it could not come to power until the Roman Empire, that is the Caesars, the Roman government, collapsed and was taken out of the way. And history recorded that 2,000 years ago. Okay? So, uh, and, and this is what has been believed by every generation of Christians, true Bible-believing Christians, from the first century Christians under Paul's ministry, right up until 1805 A.D., the beginning of the 19th century. And it's only since then that Protestants ever heard of futurism, that Daniel's seven-year period of time wasn't going to be fulfilled until the future, and much less that it won't be Jesus, Messiah, the Prince, that will fulfill it, but an Antichrist will fulfill it. You see, you can't get much more deceived than that, can you? And that's precisely what they're teaching from all the churches. That's what they taught in my churches from as little, for as young as I was. That it's for as long as I could remember in the churches, that's what they taught me. And when I became a man and got married and cho chose my own church to go to, that church as well taught futurism. And every denomination of Christianity, every denomination of Protestantism and evangelicalism teach one form or another of futurism that Daniel's 70th week is yet future. In other words, everyone who professes himself to be a Christian, who goes to a non-Roman Catholic church, literally says, Messiah has not yet come in the flesh. They deny the Christ that bought them when they deny the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled 2,000 years ago that Jesus fulfilled it. They say it's a yet in the future. <clears throat> now, you can't get much more deceived than that. Now, I'll turn it over to Yerk. We'll see what poor progress we can make. Remember, we're showing you proof texts in the New Testament that prove beyond any doubt, that prove beyond any argument that Jesus perfectly and completely fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel, it's over. And if you deny it, 
You simply deny that Jesus was the Messiah, the Prince. Over to you, Yerk. That means that you are led by the spirit of Antichrist and not by the spirit of Christ. That's but exactly right. Before we go into that, Tom, you just gave uh, to me the stop word saying about the tribulation. And I think one of the most important verses that we have to understand as Christians, and I want you to go in there and uh, dissect that a little bit for our listeners, is John chapter 16, verse 33. John chapter 16 is one of the most important chapters anyway, because that's in the beginning, I think, when Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. But in verse 33, he says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Those are the words of Jesus Christ our Lord. And I'm going to take a little bit time to explain this verse as way, in the way that I understand and then I want to leave it over to Tom. Because he just spoke of the tribulation. There are uh, as you probably saw with my search engine, search engine there of the King James Bible, a few more occasions in the King James Bible where you find the word tribulation, but I have chosen to speak about this. It is because as Jesus Christ says, we will only have peace in him, that in me he might have peace. That means they can speak of peace and security all day long in this world as they want, but they will never ever give you the peace of Jesus Christ. Only in him we will have peace. He continues to say, in the world ye shall have tribulation. That he, he said on another occasion that we should live in the world, but not be of the world. Yeah? He knows that we are in our flesh, living in this world. And here he says that as long as we live here in this world, we will have tribulation. He does not say there will be a big tribulation at the end of time. He says in the world you will have tribulation. He says this to his disciples at that moment, who later become the apostles. He says that because they are teaching that to everyone else, he teaches that to all the people living in the quote-unquote church age, the age we are in, the last 2,000 years after Jesus Christ went to the cross and left this world and sent the Comforter to us. He said, we will only have peace in him, in the world, as long as we are in the flesh here in this world, as Bible-believing Jesus Christ commandments following Christians, we will have tribulation, but he also comforts us and says, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. When we are born again, we are Christians, we are in Christ, we have also overcome the world. We should not care for the troubles in this world anymore, because we have peace in him. Because he is in us and we are in him. As Jesus Christ says, as the Father is in me and I am in the Father, you are in me. Tom, is there anything you can add to that? I think you sure have something to say, right? But tribulation-wise, I thought this was a very important subject maybe to start the broadcast today about. Well, absolutely. And, and the key thing we have to remember is for all the generations uh, uh, since the very first century, Christians have suffered tribulation and persecution. And, and that's the, the criminal element in the whole futurist scheme of things. What proves uh, uh, that historicism is the correct school of Bible prophecy is all the historical record of the tribulation of the saints from the very beginning up till now. You see, for futurism to get a foothold, it had to de-emphasize all the persecution and tribulation of the saints through history and focus all the attention on a future period of seven years as though the body of Christ has never suffered any persecution, but the persecution's coming in the future. Okay? 
And then at the same time telling us that we're going to be raptured out before the tribulation comes. Isn't that convenient? All right. But the truth of the matter is, all throughout history, God's people have been persecuted. They have suffered tribulation to the point of losing their heads, losing their fortune, losing their children, losing their property, losing their wives, their careers, losing their countries and being uh, forced to move even to foreign continents, that which drove the immigrants to this country, to the Western Hemisphere, to what we now know as the United States of America, came as the result of the Roman Catholic papacy and its persecution of those who said that Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist. They knew that if they were going to remain in that, st in that stand, Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist, if they stayed in Europe, they were going to be persecuted. They wanted a chance, and the chance had come to immigrate to this hemisphere, to get away from the popes and the kings. Okay? This kind of reminds you of a 1970s rock and roll song, doesn't it? That's right. It was even spoken of by, believe it or not, of all things, a rock group. They came to this country seeking peace and escape from popes and kings. Okay, that's why they came here. Persecution <clears throat> from the Roman Catholic Church, from the Roman Catholic Pope, and from all the kings of Europe who were the literal persecutors uh, that were that was uh, there was it was their responsibility to to annihilate protestants those who protested the antichrist okay so all our pastors in addition to foisting upon us a completely erroneous interpretation of daniel's prophecy a, a, a completely erroneous future fulfillment <coughs> of Daniel's prophecy have also made it obsolete <coughs> and not politically correct to study any longer the persecution of the saints. Okay? The Bible talks about the persecution of the saints, doesn't it? Why? Why? Because it's important. We're not to forget it. But we have. You see, you can go all over Christendom today and ask somebody, who, anybody you choose, who is the Antichrist? And you'll never hear it that it's the Pope, the papacy. They've made us completely forget the martyrs of Jesus and who persecuted them to death. Now, see, if in our churches we continued to study the history of God's people throughout the ages, along with that study would come education like we used to get from books like Fox's Book of Martyrs, which literally records the historical accounts of the saints of God and how they were persecuted by the papacy and the kings of Europe. The horrific tortures, dismemberments, and every kind of evil against God's people. For what? Not that they believed in Jesus, but because they believed the papacy was the Antichrist, and they were absolutely correct. Absolutely, unerringly correct. So why are we so ignorant today? We can only thank our pastors. They've come from Jesuit-controlled seminaries where it's no longer politically correct to keep talking about the criminality of the Roman Catholic Church 
and the diabolical popes that ruled and reigned throughout the Christian era. They want peace and unity. They want. They insist that the Roman Catholic Church is a Christian church, and it couldn't be any further from Christianity. It is a counterfeit church that dares to call itself Christian. And uh, how do we know? What, how is the easiest way? Yes, it's easy to know that it's not a Christian church because most of their priests are pedophiles, sodomites, homosexuals, they're nuns likewise. It's not just that. But the thing that makes it so easy to mark the Roman Catholic Church as a counterfeit Christian church, a false church, what the Bible calls the synagogue of Satan is because they continue to make sacrifices. The sacrifice of the Mass is the single most condemning characteristic of the Antichrist Church, the Church of Antichrist. The Mass of the Roman Catholic Church is a sacrifice that's dogma that is taught in the Roman Catholic Church that you must believe on pain of excommunication and eternal damnation. That that bread that you see, this, this old picture of Antichrist Pope John Paul II elevating above his head, they teach in the Roman Catholic Church that that piece of bread and the wine that goes with it is the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ. Never mind that it still looks like bread. It tastes like bread. It smells like bread. It breaks like bread. Likewise, the wine. Those are just simply accidents, they say, that it still tastes like bread. It still tastes like wine. That's an accident. What is true, according to the Roman Catholic dogma, is that the bread and the wine are the literal blood and body of Jesus, the self-same Jesus that died on the cross 2,000 years ago. And when the Pope breaks the bread and drinks the wine, he is crucifying Christ afresh. That is dogma in the Roman Catholic Church. You must believe that the priest has the power to change the bread and wine into the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity to be sacrificed again and again and again for the last 1,800 years on the altars of the Roman Catholic Church. That leads us perfectly to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11, Tom. Let me just read it, and you can continue with your explanation, which is a wonderful yes. way to switch from the one subject to the other, but it all belongs together, of course. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11, it says, And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. So here Hebrews, of course, is speaking of the Levite priests. They were already standing daily there and making sacrifices and offerings to God in the temple. But those sacrifices could never take away sins. And the Roman Catholic Church, because of their dispensational theology, is the continuation of the Levites of the Old Testament. And their priests are doing exactly the same thing thousands of times all over the world. Exactly that quote-unquote mass that Tom was just speaking about. Please go on, brother. Well, common sense dictates that if in 70 AD, some 37 years or 40 years after Christ was crucified, that God sent his people, the Romans... Messiah the Prince sent his people, those that he chose, to destroy the city and the sanctuary in 70 AD to stop this animal sacrificial system that could never take away sin. He sent the Roman 10th Legion to completely destroy that temple so that nobody could sew the veil of the temple back together again and continue animal sacrifices. The altar had to be destroyed. All of the Temple Mount worship had to come to an end. Otherwise, in the minds of, of the people of the world, 
Jesus would never would have died in vain if they'd continue to make animal sacrifices. And we would all die in our sins because they, the blood of lambs and goats never took away sin. They only pointed to the eventual crucifixion of Christ. The only sacrifice in the history of the world that has the power to take away sin. The righteous blood of the Christ, Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come according to Daniel's prophecy. And uh, when the Jews rejected him, they had nothing left to do but to restore what they had done since the days of Moses, to restore the Temple Mount worship. Morning and noon, or morning and night, to offer sacrifices and oblations, and to continue the annual ritual of once a year, the Day of Atonement. The high priest goes into the Holy of Holies and makes propitiatory sacrifice for the whole nation of Israel. If that's the case, what about Jesus? You see. To continue to make animal sacrifices is to deny that Messiah came in the flesh. Okay? And that's what they did. They denied that Jesus was the Christ. They did not understand Daniel's prophecy. They knew not the time of their visitation when they should have been able to put a red X on the calendar. He will be here right on this date. Okay, the calendar keepers in Jerusalem knew the timing of the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince. They could have forwarded the, the calendar and put a red X on the calendar, and everybody in Jerusalem would have been down at the River Jordan watching Jesus get baptized and hail him, Hosanna, son of the living God. King of kings, Lord of lords, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We are redeemed. But that's not what happened, is it? No, and the Jews, having rejected Jesus, even after seeing what happened on the day of his crucifixion and the days uh, immediately afterwards, the the many miracles that took place, that no one could deny they returned to animal sacrifices. What else could they do if they rejected Christ as their Messiah? And they continued to make sacrifices, eating and drinking damnation to themselves. And when 70 AD rolled around and God put an end to that abomination, Guess what? Not long after that, the restrainer was taken out of the way in Rome. The Caesars beat feet for Byzantium, I always like to say. And then the papacy stood up. The little horn of Daniel stood up. That little horn with eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great words of blasphemy against the Most High. It's the papacy. It can't be anybody but the papacy. There's no guesswork in this. There's no trial and error. There's no speculation. It's been fulfilled in history, certified by every generation of Christian from that day forward up until 1805. And your pastor never told you any of these things, did he? Wonder why? Because it's been talked about in the houses of God all throughout the generations. They were historicists. They saw the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy in history. The ministry of Christ, the seven-year ministry of Christ. First three and a half years, Jesus in the flesh. The last three and a half years, Jesus in the Spirit. And then, after the 490th year was over, the 70th week of Daniel drew to a close, having rejected for the last time their Messiah, Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come, that Daniel prophesied, 
the one who would come in 70 times, seven times, finally rejected him. The Sanhedrin, the government of Israel, rejected him, stoned Stephen to solidify their decision, baptized it in wickedness, the blood of the saints, the martyr of Jesus, and then the gospel went to the Gentiles. And it's been our responsibility ever since. And God's people have told the truth for 2,000 years about the 70th week of Daniel. It was only until 1805 that the truth about the 70th week of Daniel was brought into question. And it was done so only to protect the identity of the Antichrist. No more were the Protestants going to be allowed scot-free to go around the world saying, Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist. And they started teaching a future fulfillment and saying that it was going to be fulfilled by the Antichrist. And at the same time, causing God's people to deny that he ever came. Are you beginning to wrap your brain around this? How we've been deceived? How long is it going to take? No, I know I've lived through this. I know it's hard to give up on the futurist teaching. You've been taught it all your life. You've never heard the truth ever. And your blessed hope, you've been taught to believe that your blessed hope is not the resurrection as it's taught in the Bible, but the rapture. And the rapture is directly attached to that seven-year period of time. Either at its beginning or its middle or its end, God's people are supposed to be raptured out. And we just love the rapture so much. It's like frosting on a chocolate cake. Chocolate frosting on a chocolate cake. Who would ever scrape away the chocolate frosting to eat the dry old chocolate cake? Well, that's what the rapture is. It's the chocolate frosting that the Jesuits put on the futurist cake so that you would never spit it out of your mouth. You love that rapture so much that you would deny the obvious truth just to hold on to the false hope of, a, of an escape from tribulation when there's never been an escape for God's people for tribulation. Papal tribulation is given. We know that the only peace we're going to get in this world is from the Prince of Peace, never from the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, the papacy from him, and all the kings of the earth that serve him, we, God's people, who maintain that Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist, we shall suffer persecution. And tribulation is our middle name. But we suffer it long-sufferingly. We suffer it as gracefully as we possibly can, upholding Christ the one who came 2,000 years ago and fulfilled Daniel's prophecy. Beginning, middle, and end. There's nothing to be fulfilled in the future. The whole world relies upon us to tell the truth. And the whole Christian world is stuck in believing a delusion. Okay, a strong delusion that God's people just simply don't want to let go of. Never mind that the scriptures perfectly destroy their futurist teaching. They love that rapture so much they just can't let it go. 
what are you going to do when somebody says the, the seven-year tribulation is about to begin? The Antichrist has just signed a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews to allow them to begin their building of a temple and to begin animal sacrifices again. Are you going to put a red X on the calendar about three and a half years down the road? And what if three and a half years comes and the rapture hasn't taken place? Are you going to make a, cal a mark three and a half years after that? A red X? And what if the seven years comes and goes and no rapture? What's going to happen to your faith? Are you going to wait till then to believe the truth? What about the great disappointment? I think many people are going literally their hearts are going to stop. They're going to believe that they've been, quote unquote, and I hate this term, but I got to use it, left behind. That's how much they believe in futurism. That's how much they want to believe in futurism. After this so called seven year period has begun, has ended, and 40 years down the road, Christ still hasn't raptured them out. What do you think they're going to do with their faith? What's their faith going to be worth? Are you going to be one of them? So distraught as to be doubtful that the gospel is the truth? Your pastor has prepared you for that. To be disappointed. To lose your faith. Now, how valuable is that man that you love so much? Has your love been misdirected? Don't worry, people. I've had to ask myself all those very same questions. And I came to the truth kicking and screaming. I avoided the truth like a plague but it came to the point where I could no longer deny the truth. The 70th week of Daniel is over. And if you say it's future, you're literally denying that Jesus came in the flesh, that Messiah came in the flesh. That, the Bible plainly says, is the spirit of Antichrist. I hope I've made it clear Back to you, Yerk. I think so, Tom. I think you made your point very clear. And um, I think also it was very interesting to go in this verse of John chapter 16, verse 33, to tell the people that it is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous of us who are living now in these quote-unquote end times or in the end of the end times because, you know, <laughs> Jesus Christ said that these are already the last days. So when we are living in these last days that we are living in today, that we think we will have tribulation and all the Christians before us never ever suffered any tribulation. That is just too ridiculous and the Bible tells us otherwise. John 16, 33 is one of the verses. Okay, we also went into uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. And we established that this is a continuation today in the Roman Catholic Church, which is still continuing in their mass, in their sacrifice, with their dogma of transubstantiation, which uh, is a change of the substance of the bread and the wine from bread and wine into Body, soul, flesh and blood, divinity and humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they teach. They have manifested that in the Council of Trent in the 16th century. And they condemn everyone who does not believe the dogma of transubstantiation. They call him anathema. He is excommunicated. That means he is outside of any salvation that is only to be reached within the Roman Catholic Church. And when you cannot be um, saved by the Roman Catholic Church, you are lost and therefore you are a, 
Well, yeah, we, we have a term in Germany that's that's called a quote unquote free man. That means that you are uh, uh, free to be killed by anyone, and it is even a, a, a meritorial work. Is is that the right word? Term? A meritorial. Uh, I, I don't yes, in, yeah. in Roman Catholic canon law. You are a heretic if you do not believe that the priest has the power to change the bread and wine into the, into the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ, the whole Christ, nothing lacking, and then sacrifice him once again on the altar. You are a heretic if you do not believe this. And according to the Third and Fourth Lateran Councils, Roman Catholic canon law established at the Lateran Council, number three and four, that a her it is lawful, not only lawful, to kill a heretic, but it is a meritorious work. You actually earn grace. Meritorious, yeah, that's the word I was yes. looking for. Uh, Merit, just, just, the word. just have a look at this quote, Tom, from Jesuit priest Alfonso Salmeron. That's from the Council of Trent. Let me just read this, and then you can elaborate on it a little bit more. This Jesuit priest said, The Bishop of Rome, the successor of St. Peter, can, for the good of his flock, take away with the world the life of the body. He can make war upon heretics and schismatics, and exterminate them, employing for this purpose the Catholic princes because Jesus Christ, in sending him to feed his sheep, has authorized him to cast out and kill the wolves if they injure that flock. And what is more, if the leader of the flock harms them, either through a contagious disease or by butting them with his horns, the shepherd may, dispose, uh, may depose him from his command and headship in the flock. In temporal things, God has given to St. Peter and his, successor, uh, his successors only an indirect dominion over all the empires and kingdoms of the world, in virtue of which he may, if the interest of the church require it, alter and transfer them from one hand to another. So, in all of that gobbledygook, what you have is a, is a definitive statement from the most authoritative council in the history of the Roman Catholic Church, the, the Council of Trent, by a Jesuit who, an order of the Roman Catholic priests that oversaw, directed, and guided, and controlled the Council of Trent, that the Pope has ultimate authority over all heretics, can command them to be killed, and can pass that responsibility on to the kings of the earth who serve him. And the civil powers then, the governments of all Roman Catholic nations, are it is incumbent upon them to round up the heretics and dispose of them as conveniently as possible. And historically, uh, the civil power got a third of the booty the papacy got a third of the booty, and the other third was shared by the communities that helped to round up these Bible-believing Christians called heretics. So literally, their own goods worked against them as bribery to get both the kings, the people of the nations, and the papacy and all of his priests, monks, and, and, and bishops, and cardinals, to uni and, and literally, we're talking everybody now, without exception. This is a, the whole mass of humanity is bribed with the, the, the proceeds or the booty taken from rounding up all the heretics and burning them at the stake or beheading them or however they wish to dispose of them. That's official teaching in the Council of Church, uh, the Council of Trent, the most authoritative council in the history of the Roman Catholic Church. It was convened as a result of the Protestant Reformation when the Vatican, the papacy, the Jesuits determined 
to engage in an all-out war of annihilation against Protestantism. And this is what was determined at the Council of Trent. And that's been the purpose of the papacy, the kings of the earth who serve him, and the Jesuit order ever since. Or they cease to be Jesuits. Okay? How in God's name, Tom, can you think of a future seven-year tribulation when the sentence here reads, the Bishop of Rome can make war upon heretics and schismatics and exterminate them, employing for this purpose the Catholic princes, that is, the governments of the, the world. The governments of Europe, the yeah. governments of, of all the world. Yeah, the, yep. the kings of the world who have co uh, committed fornication with the whore of Babylon, as it is written That's in right. Revelation chapter 17, verse 2, and Revelation right. chapter 18, verse 2 and 3. How can anybody believe in only a seven-year tribulation when here in the midst of the 16th century Jesuit priest Alfonso Salmeron says that the Bishop of Rome can make war upon heretics and schismatics and exterminate them? What is making war on heretics and exterminating them but tribulation? That's right. Persecution, tribulation, every kind of torture, every kind of lethal punishment. Every kind of cruel treatment, every abomination that a man can imagine has been created and perpetrated upon God's people all throughout the Christian era. Quotes all like throughout the history of the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church, God's people have suffered unending persecution. Quotes like and, this, uh, Tom. We never talk about it in the churches. Why? Hmm. Because they want us to believe that the persecution won't come until the last seven years before Christ returns. Well, I'm here to tell you, Rome has every intent to make it look like that is a biblical fulfillment. Rome has every intention of, just like the Antichrist or Satan himself would do, execute as many Bible-believing Christians as he possibly can. So there's no hope that Rome won't try to conjure up, with the cooperation of the kings of the earth, a brutal period of seven years of tribulation. But let me hear, I'm here to tell you, 70th week of Daniel was over 2,000 years ago. And if they have to uh, spill the blood of non-Roman Catholics to make it look like this future seven-year period of time is a reality despite what we're telling you, that's exactly what they intend to do. Trouble is, I don't think the Antichrist in Rome has enough power to start and stop the persecution on a rigid seven-year calendar. So it's going to be as long as the Pope wants to. And look, there's been no stopping him for the last 1,500 years. What's to stop him now? This is the tragedy and the great error that has resulted from hushing up talk about the history of Bible-believing Christians for the last 1,500 years. The earth is literally soaked with the blood of the righteous of God's people. There has been no cessation of the murder of God's people by the papacy and the kings of the earth throughout the entire period of time we call the Christian era. The pagan Romans did it, feeding us to the lions, crucifying us, burning us at the stake, burning us on crosses. But woe, woe, woe for Christians when the papacy came to power. As we pointed, in a pre pointed out in a previous uh, broadcast, it's recorded in one of Henry Grattan Guinness's precious books, a communal prayer that the early Christians, the early Christians prayed. Before the Caesars were taken out of the way, they prayed for the longevity, the health, the wealth, the prosperity, the longevity of the pagan Roman Caesars, because, and only because they knew 
that when they were taken out of the way, that man of sin would be revealed. And they had no hope but to pray for the wicked papal uh, Roman Caesars because they knew the papacy was going to replace them when the restrainer was taken out of the way. And then persecution would take place like not has ever been seen in the history of the world. I can read it right here, Tom. From Henry Gretton, Genesis, Romanism and the Reformation, pages 195 and 196. It is taken from Tertullian's Apology, thus describes the habit of the Christian Church of the 2nd century to pray for the security of the Roman Empire in the knowledge, not in the suspicion, <laughs> but in the knowledge that its downfall, the downfall of the Roman Empire, would bring the catastrophe of the reign of Antichrist and the ruin of the world. Addressing the rulers of the world, Tertullian, he says, quote, This is the prayer of the Christians of the very first century. We offer prayer for the safety of our princes to the eternal, the true, the living God, whose favor, beyond all others, they must themselves desire. Thither we lift our eyes with hands outstretched, because free from sin, with head uncovered, for we have nothing whereof to be ashamed. Finally, without a monitor, because it is from the heart we supplicate. And without ceasing for all our emperors, we offer prayer. We pray for life prolonged, for security to the empire. With our hands thus stretched out and up to God, rend us with your iron claws. Hang us up on crosses, wrap us up in flames, take our heads from us with the sword, let loose the wild beasts upon us. The very attitude of a Christian praying is the preparation for all punishment. Let this good rulers be your work, wring from us the soul, beseeching God on the Emperor's behalf. Upon the truth of God and devotion to his name, put the brand of crime. There is also another and a greater necessity for our offering prayer in behalf of the emperors, nay, for the complete stability of the empire and for Roman interests in general. For we know that a mighty shock impending over the whole earth, in fact, the very end of all things, threatening dreadful woes, is only retarded by the continued existence of the Roman Empire. We have no desire then to be overtaken by these dire events, and in praying that their coming may be delayed, we are lending our aid to Rome's duration. Unquote. There you have it. There you have it. In history, early history, not many generations after Christ's crucifixion, God's people praying for the longevity of the Roman Caesars because they knew that great catastrophe, the reign of Antichrist, would take place. And no more wicked persecution would ever take place in the history of the world but what the Antichrist would perpetrate upon God's people. Now you got to ask yourself, what happened to all the history of the persecution of the popes against God's people? Whatever happened to the bloody history of the papacy as he tried to devour every man, woman, and child who said, Jesus is the Christ and the papacy is the Antichrist? Where is the history? Pastor, it's not hard to find. It used to be mandatory reading in all the churches. Fox's Book of Martyrs. You can read it for free online. But don't ask your pastor to recommend it to you. He wants you to think highly of the Roman Catholic Church. Pedophile priests and all. Because they think Roman Catholicism is Christianity, and they want you to be peacefully united with that Roman Catholic Church in preparation for Christ's return. 
in preparation for the great tribulation, there must be unity among the saints. That's what they want. Look, if you believe what I believe, that there is no future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week, as we've proven beyond any doubt. And continue to prove. That's right. And we're not done proving it yet. No, no. Uh, that simply means that the future Antichrist that they're predicting is, is, a, an, is a lie. You have to admit that the future Antichrist that they say that's going to sign a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews, on and on and on, going to let them build a temple, going to let them begin animal sacrifices again, so that they can stand at the altar making the self-same sacrifice day in, day out, shedding the blood of animals that cannot take away sin. If that future Antichrist is a lie, then you have to look in history to find the Antichrist. Let me tell you something. God's people, led by the Holy Spirit, found him before he was ever created, before he ever took the throne in Rome. He was predicted and positively identified by Paul to the Thessalonians in Thessalonians 2. He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Who was then reigning at that time Paul spoke to the Thessalonians? There can be no error. It was the Roman civil power. And when it was taken out of the way, what, re what filled the power vacuum in Rome? When the Roman Empire fell, the civil authorities crumbled and were taken out of the way, taken to Constantinople, by the way. Who filled that power vacuum? No one argues that it was anyone other than the papacy, the Bishop of Rome. That part of history is not disputed by anyone, not even the papacy. And that's what marks him as the man of sin, the son of perdition. That against which the second century Christians fervently prayed would never come if only the Caesars were preserved. Look, can any of your pastors and priesters be so convincing about their future Antichrist as we have been about the historical Antichrist? Can they even come close? History is concrete. It's settled for all time. The future, at best, is speculative. Right out of the gate, you got the odds overwhelmingly against you. Your futurism is speculation. You cannot say that about historicism. It's concrete. What could possibly happen in the future to trump what has happened in history? What could possibly happen to make God's people throughout the Christian era deny that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. This I must see, but I'll never see it. We have our Antichrist. The body of Christ throughout history has had its Antichrist, its man of sin, its little horn, with eyes like eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great blasphemies against the Most High. It's the one who says, who can you make of me but God? That's the papacy. It's codified in Roman Catholic canon law. It can be researched and drawn up and used 
to prove the assertion that the papacy is that man of sin. If anyone prior to 1805 could hear what we are taught and what we believe in the Protestant and evangelical churches in this world, we would be lucky if they only laughed us to scorn. Because when we believe that the papacy is not the Antichrist and that the Antichrist of history did not fulfill every single prophecy in the Bible about the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, the beast, the Antichrist, then we are literally spitting upon the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. We have exonerated that beast that destroyed God's people for the last 15 to 1700 years. That's right. We've let their executioner go free. More than that, we call him the head of the Christian world. The kings of the earth now call the papacy the greatest moral authority on earth. And he must be obeyed as if he were God. And that's why the Pope is free to come and go through the halls of government in this country. And this country responds to his every whim by sending our military wherever they are needed to promote the papal agenda wherever in the world it's to be exercised. The United States is the very battle axe for the papacy. This, what we dare to call a Christian nation, and even worse, the greatest Christian nation in the history of the world, has become the very servant of the Antichrist and is ready to persecute on a whim anyone who reveals the truth. But that's what I intend to do till they take my life. The papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. You have your Antichrist. You've had him for 1,800 years, 1,700 years. There is no future Antichrist unless he be a successor of the current and the historical Antichrist. Every pope in succession from the very first to the very last will be that man of sin that Paul predicted, that the Thessalonians prayed against, that every Bible-believing Christian condemned as Antichrist throughout the entire Christian era. So let's put away this stupid futurism that's a nothing but the shame of God's people and return to the truth. Thank you.